Now I'm pleased to welcome in Marvin Freeman, a veteran of 10 major league seasons and the man behind the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation. Marvin, thank you so much for the time. Great to be here, man. I appreciate it. Uh, Marvin, actually, uh, baseball, you know, currently dealing with a lockout, uh, the first work stop since 1994, which you were a part of. Uh, as someone who lived through that, how much frustration and anxiousness uh, comes with that uncertainty of not knowing when you're going to get back in the field? Well, it's a lot of frustration because, you know, you're not in control of your own destiny. You, you know, going into spring training, you have a particular date set in mind for when you're going to start getting your baseball activities back going. Um, you train for it all winter, and then now that date is up in the air, so you don't know, you know, how your uh, workout programs are going to go. You know, are you going to ramp up to start facing hitters, or are you going to slow down because you don't know when the actual date is going to jump off? So it's really frustrating from a player standpoint, and, um, you know, you just want to get things resolved so you can get out there and get the actual game started. You know, that's where we – that's our sweet spot. That's where we live. We live on the field, and – you know, all this other stuff, you know, the business part of it is things that has to be done. But at the same time, we want to take care of our own business. That 94 season, I mean, obviously it ended a rough way for you after a very high point in Rockies history, a 2.80 ERA that season. That still remains a Rockies uh, single season record. That 8.33 winning percentage you had that year, the 15th best of anybody in the National League during the expansion area. I'm curious from your perspective, having uh, been there, how much of a challenge it was pitching in Coors Field. Paul Bird told me it's not those starts at Coors that impacted him. It was the ones afterwards when you were trying to compensate where you were in Denver for your breaking ball uh, and trying to get that stuff to bite the same way. It would impact him later on. How did you kind of deal with that, uh, the, the impact of, of, of pitching in Coors and what would come after it? Well, you know, when they first got the Rocky Stadium, it was uh, Mile High Stadium. And so Coors Field was built in 95, and that's when we transitioned over there. But I pitched my first year in Cor at um, Mile High Stadium. So it was like 290 to left field. I mean, you can choke up and, and just punch the ball and hit a home run over there. But to right field, it was like 440 to the gap, and it was a lot easier to pitch to a particular part of the ballpark. So I just utilized the outside part of the plate to righties, tried to make sure I kept the ball in on lefties or, or kept the ball down in the way and just made them hit the ball. If they're going to hit the ball the other way, it was going to be on the ground and um, really just tried to make sure I didn't overdo things. Um, you know, the air is a little lighter in Denver. So the first thing pitchers try and do is overemphasize spinning the ball, which is the worst thing that they can do because sometimes you – try too hard is spinning so fast that it won't grab the air and break because the air is lighter. So what you had, what I tried to do is make sure I finished every pitch a little bit lower than where I normally wanted to throw it. Um, if your breaking ball is only breaking 10 inches, then you got to start it five inches lower than where you normally started just to get it to end up in the same place. So just being able to uh, really pitch ahead in counts, um, utilize the um, opposite field and make guys swing the bat was uh, my formula for going in. But then when we moved over to Coors Field, it was a little different because it seemed like every part of the ballpark was the wind was blowing out all the time every day. And so there was really no place that you can actually run to. You know, you just had to make sure that your team scored more than the next team. Um, it was really difficult. Coors Field is the outfield is so wide. So many balls can drop in if the outfielders are playing so deep. But then if they're not playing deep, balls are going over their heads. So it's really hard for a pitcher to pitch there. There was no human door back then. So the balls were jumping out of there like like super balls. And, um, you know, it's always I always call it a pitcher's nightmare. You know, you you go out there and you do some things that you do at other parks. And they stay in the ballpark, but there, you know, you know, you got a routine fly ball and it's five rolls up. So it's frustrating, but both teams have to pitch there. Both um, um, starters have to go out there and try and get guys out. But the thing about us is you're going to get half your starts at Coors Field when those other guys come in for one or two, maybe one or two starts at the most. And a lot of guys are ducking Coors Field when they got to go out there and pitch. So it's always some type of, you know, not oh, I'm not feeling too good today. Uh, my stomach might be hurting. So push me back a start. And, you know, I saw a lot of that coming in. 
Well, having success in Denver is a feat in itself, and having success the way you did in 94 certainly a feat as well. Uh, you know, Marvin, obviously February being Black History Month, what does that mean for you uh, when it comes to being not only, you know, a, a player in the big leagues, but somebody, you know, who is a product of an HBCU at Jackson State? Well, you know, every day is Black History Month for me. Um, you know, being an African-American, I can't just set one month aside and say this is the month that we're going to stand out. I've always lived my life to the, to the point that I need to find out what my history needs to be so that I can, you know, be able to teach my kids what the actual, you know, contributions are. But um, it does shed a little light on African-Americans in baseball. Um, I mean, um, the numbers when I played, it was 18 to 20 percent. Uh, African-American players in the league. Now I think it's down to maybe six or seven percent. So the numbers aren't going in a favorable direction, although we're doing things now um, to help grow the game with, um, you know, a lot of development stuff we're doing here in Atlanta. Um, a lot of stuff we're doing MLB develop, developing these young high school players. Got a lot of kids coming up through the um, ranks and hopefully those numbers will improve. But it does give us an opportunity to kind of really shine a light on you know, the Jackie Robinsons and the Hank Aarons and guys that, that went through it when um, it was basically they were the only ones there. We get to see how they dealt with adversity, how they overcame it, how mentally tough they needed to be. And those are some of the same um, things that we teach kids nowadays that, um, you know, you still got to go out there and compete, but there's other things you have to be able to have. And it's more than talent. Sometimes you have to be able to, um, just weather a lot of different things that, you know, you don't think is going to be part of actually baseball, which they're not, but you still have to deal with them. So um, just being, um, making people aware that, you know, we have a history in this country is um, probably the most important part of Black History Month for me. Yeah, I mean, I want to get into a little bit, obviously, with what's going on to, you know, especially here in the Atlanta area uh, with developing players. But do you feel a sense of obligation then to educate the younger generations? I mean, certainly the kids that you work with through the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation, the ones that you you physically train, you know, during the Freeman baseball uh, and pro performance pitching. Do you feel an obligation then to kind of work through them and help them to understand the past? Oh, absolutely. Because you know what? When I was growing up, I had, you know, older men that introduced me to the game, older men that made sure I got to the games. They, you know, they, they provided the resources that allowed me to go out there and play. If I didn't have money to buy spikes, you know, the neighborhood would chip in and get it. They wanted to make sure that we had, you know, a, a stepping stone or a resource that was going to allow us to have some of the same opportunities that people that might have had a little bit more we're able to do. Um, so I always feel like it's an obligation for me to give back to these young men, the things that I know and the things that I've learned and hopefully have them avoid some of the um, obstacles and, and, and even some of the pitfalls that I've seen and um, enjoy some of the successes that I've had, not only on the field, but off the field. And really all that starts with being able to, you know, organize yourself in a way that you can prepare to um, be successful. And it doesn't always necessarily end with baseball because, you know, 99% of these kids won't play in the major leagues, but a hundred percent of them can go on and be, you know, productive members in society. They can raise their families. They can have a, a hand in helping someone else. And those are the things that Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation stands for. It stands for character, character building, mentorship, things that's going to help, you know, these young men grow and then help someone else. So it's always about passing the torch and hoping that we can continue to bridge gaps that's, that are open and, and give all these guys an opportunity to realize their potential. You started the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation in 2018. Uh, you mentioned a little bit there to bridge the financial gap for underserved youth in education and sports. What do you think is the missing element uh, in terms of growing the game? Obviously, MLB you know, does its work through the field reimbursement program. Uh, they've done, you know, 31 fields across 18 states. The Braves, one of your former teams, uh, you know, they obviously have a lot that they do in terms of, you know, support and other initiatives. But I've heard Dusty Baker say this, that, that he feels like and he obviously was in a position with his kids where he could make sure that they played at a high level. But is it really just a matter of these kids getting an opportunity to play the sport and play it at a high level against other high caliber kids? Well, that's that's the end result. Um 
Right now, I'm in a field that um, I deal with a lot of kids that are 12, 13, 14 years old. I call those the transitional years. Um, they're either going to decide to play baseball in high school or they're going to figure out, hey, I don't know what I'm doing. This game is too hard. Uh, I'm going to try something else. Well, I'm trying to fill that void to giving these guys some confidence, some understanding, some knowledge, you know, some things that they can work on to help them go from that little league where they were dominating to moving back to 60 feet, six inches. And now it's a little bit tougher. The fields are bigger. The game is a little bit faster. And, you know, that's when you lose a lot of these guys, especially pitchers. I specialize in trying to, you know, make pitchers better because I know how hard it is once you get on that field and you don't have a plan or idea what it is you're trying to do. And people are yelling out, bend your back, just throw strikes, take a deep breath. Well, you know, that, that all sounds good. But if you can't give them something tangible that they can apply, something they've worked on, something they've built confidence in, then they're going to go play another position because pitching is the number one position on the field for a reason. That's because it's the toughest. You're on a mound. You're raised up above the other players out there. So I tell guys all the time, all eyes are going to be on you. And if you're not able to stand up to that challenge or you're not willing to accept the responsibility and it might be, it might not be the right position. So I'm trying to catch them now before they get to that point, teach them some things that's going to help them, you know, again, have a better understanding of being good at their position and, and try and get them to that, that high school team. I'm trying to let all my guys in middle school get better enough, get good enough to make their high school team and the high school guys try and get some college team. And if they're good enough in college, you know, things will take care of themselves, but you know, there's a lot of talent down here in Georgia. Me moving down here from Chicago, I get to see um, more baseball, more players that's interested in the game, and I get to get my hands on a lot more kids that that have an opportunity to keep moving up the ranks, basically. I love that you mentioned that there with everybody kind of, you know, being in their ear a little bit, because I was curious about your messaging and your approach when it comes to tuning out the noise. And, you know, certainly, you know, kids can get on social media channels. They can see breakdowns of players. They can see people offering advice. There was a great Twitter uh, post this past week. I don't know if you saw it, but um, it was a video that someone posted of a young hitter and the caption said, my friend's oh, son needs help. <laughs> And yeah. his suggestions, and it, and you know, people had all these comments, and it ended up being a video of Mike Trout. But they didn't, yeah. they didn't stop people from having all their little comments below. So I guess my point to get all around to that is, how do what you know when when there's so much that they could be doing, how do you kind of get that message to the kids of this is what you should be doing, and you should be tuning out the rest of it? Well, you know, it's, it's hard because um, most of these kids are on their phones so much, they get so much stuff thrown at them. Um, you know, you see a guy on video and he's running and throwing a ball 98 miles an hour and, you know, everybody's jumping up, cheering. Yeah, hey, you know, he's got one pitch. Some coach is standing back there with a radar gun. I mean, that's that's romantic. I mean, kid that don't throw hard, he's he going to see that. He's going to be like, well, maybe this is what I need to do to help me. But these things, I call it carnival baseball. I mean, you go to a carnival, they got a booth set up. Hey, throw this ball as hard as you can. Win a Cupid doll for your girlfriend. So you got these guys just out of control, throwing the ball as hard as they can with no destination in mind, just to throw to a number. And then I just let them know how that won't play in a game. I always show videos of when pitchers throwing 95 to 100 miles an hour give up a home run. I always show where the pitch was, what the location is. And I'm like, you know, now they put the velocity up with every pitch. So was, you don't have to guess if it was 100. I'm like, look, that was 100 miles an hour. It's right down the middle. I said, it doesn't matter how hard you throw. If you can't get it in a spot that a hitter's not swinging in, then you, you're not throwing fast enough. I said, and there's never going to be a situation where you think you're throwing fast enough. So what you can do is learn how to locate and pitch with whatever you have right now. And hopefully as you develop and grow and you get more functionally stronger, then you'll be able to start picking up those uh, miles per hour. But I've proven that by being able to like digitally or video record them at a process when they first start. I take their um, numbers and I take their metrics. And then if they stick with it long enough, I hit them again in six months. They can actually visually see the improvement. The parent brings them in and they're going, hey, you know, Nobody's been able to fix my son from throwing the ball, throwing a screwball. So 
when I break them down and learn to make them understand that everything has to do with a stronger foundation, then they start buying into it because they see the success. So you can't really tell them that the things that they see is not going to work. You have to show them that the things that they're doing and why these things that they're doing will work. And, you know, if you stick with it with that type of approach, then they'll they'll believe for themselves. You won't have to convince them. They'll convince themselves. So most of the things that I do, I don't I tell people I tell pitchers all the time. I say, hey, do you feel like whatever you're doing is helping you? If they say, yeah, I say, hey, keep doing it. Do what you got to do, because mentally, if you believe standing on your head is going to make you a better pitcher, (laughs) stand on your head, man. So. You know, but there's certain things that when they find out that they are weak at, then I always tell them, hey, I'm not going to run up and down behind you and beg you to do things that's going to make you make you a better player. I can tell you what you need to do. And if you do it, then you're going to see results. If you don't, you know, hey, that's on you. So all I can do is present information that's going to be helpful give them a, a, a schedule on the things that they need to do and then challenge them to be their own best coach and their own boss and do these things on their own. Um, you know, it's a little harder when you got a 12 year old and you tell them he's got a long toss and he's got to do some run some sprints and all of this stuff when his main objective is to go out and be a kid. And I, I let, I, I allow for that, but I always tell him, Hey, when you're on the field and you're getting hammered by that other team over there, and you know you haven't done anything to help yourself get better, don't start crying. Don't be mad at the world. It's your fault. So the way you want things to come out is going to be determined by how much effort and and things you put in in preparing. So I make preparation the main thing. Preparation always builds confidence. I mean, if you know you study for a test and you know all the answers, somebody give you a pretest and you got all the answers, you're a lot more confident going in. They may switch it up when you get in class and give you a whole different test, but at least you go in there with a different level of confidence. I hear a lot of I hear a lot of taking the ego out of the equation with you, and I and I think when you talk to Tom House, obviously another you know very well known pitching coach and another former Brave, you get a lot of that with him too, where you take your your ego out of the equation. Um, is, is that kind of a big part of it too for you that you know here's the information, but you know you remove your ego and allow the kids to kind of find their own way at some point. Well, you know, I know these kids aren't going to be six, seven. You know, I know a lot of these kids don't have the same kind of background that I've had. I got to be able to see what their personality is, give them some things that they can relate to right then. They don't know me from the, the last guy that pitched 20 years ago. They don't they don't follow the history of the game like I did when I came up. So it would be, you know, foolish of me to say, well, you know, if you can't do it like like I did it, then you got no chance, which is stupid because when I came up, they had pitchers that did underhand, sidearm, submarine, you know, 5'4 to 6'8. I mean, it didn't have a size restriction. Guys were figuring out how to go out there and compete. So that's what I try and focus on. Whatever you got, let's try and make the best of what it is you got right now. So that when you go out there and you're trying to throw a ball outside, you know why it's not out there if you miss. If it is out there, you know how to continue doing that. So taking my ego out of it, I mean, that's why I got my Instagram. I put my videos up there. They can see me on there. You know, Um, a lot of times when they do see it, they're like, wow, coach, I didn't know you had it like that. I'm like, yeah, you know, I could tell you about some things you think I was the greatest of all time, but. I was just a guy out there just like them trying to find a way to get people out, you know, and and nothing that I did off the field, nothing that I said off the field was going to help me perform better when I got in the game. So just learning how to um, execute pitches and have a thought process is the way that I go about it. And there's nothing, you know, like I said, there's nothing I can do. I can't go out there for you. So you got to develop your own monster inside of you and take that guy into the games. We were talking about how bad social media can be unless they're, you know, watching back clips of you while you're coaching them. Those are always <laughs> be helpful. <laughs> so that's great. Listen, Marvin, I truly appreciate the time. And you, anyone can find out more about the Marvin Freeman Youth Foundation at MarvinFreemanYouthFoundation.org. Uh, and while you're at it, give them a follow at MarvinFreeman84 on Twitter. Marvin, man, thank you so much. I appreciate it. 
Anytime, man. Anytime you like to have me, I'll be welcome to come on.